comes. What is it that I need to grow, to imitate, to advance into the image of Jesus? And this is what I believe. You cannot achieve Christ's likeness without a struggle. I don't think you can. I don't think you can go through this life simply getting Bible knowledge, which I'm hoping you're getting Bible knowledge, but this is why, because you know from day one, these people face lots of struggles. Moses was surrounded by a bunch of whiners. Moses was surrounded by a bunch of quitters. Moses was surrounded by a brother that he's supposed to be a spiritual leader. And the first thing that he does while Moses is going out to Mount Sinai, they build a golden. And they become, and they do what they have always done. What is it that they've done for, for many, many centuries? Worship idols. Are you following me on this? Like, like if Moses is a brand new pastor of the church, dude, I'm quitting right there and there. Get your search committee again, because I am long gone. I don't have to deal with you guys. That's Moses' mindset in that regard. But here's the point of the story. See, the reason why you need the strength of the Lord is because if you embrace that He is the provided, you have to embrace His agenda. And some of the things that we are facing right now, I'm more than convinced that unless God shows up, you're not going to make it. You're not going to make it. Can I just be honest with you? You don't want to make it on your own. It's not fun. See, that mindset that, oh, I'm a self-made person, is a bunch of nonsense. That implies that you have, you have a very small vision, because if you, if, if all that is needed is you to accomplish whatever you're trying to accomplish, is a very non-attractive, see, vision. What you want is you just want to be a part of something bigger than yourself. See, Abraham is called at the very beginning, and Abraham produces a son by the name of Isaac. And Isaac brings forth children, and then one of those is selected by the name of Jacob that becomes Israel. And Israel has 12 kids, and those kids become eventually the nation of Israel. The point of the story is that Abraham is called was simply a vehicle to carry a larger vision that eventually brought forth a Messiah. A savior, and that's exactly a role right now. Your strength in God is a reflection of the task that you have in front of you. That God has anointed you, empowered you, He has visited your soul, your heart, not because He wants you to be better, although I'm all for you to be better. It's not because you need to get healed, although I'm all for your healing. What happens at the end is that the strength of the Lord is the one that Paul is going to pin out, is going to send out to the churches in Philippi, chapter 4, verse 13, that we have memorized for many, many years now. It is in the middle of this sail, in the middle of this jail, that I am able, Paul says, to convey and to tell you that I can do all things. Because here is the call for those who are following Jesus Christ. You are not called to conquer. You're only called to remain strong. You are never called to be victorious. You're simply called to stay put. Why am I saying this? Look at me. Because Jesus had already conquered. All you have to do is to stay, stand firm. Stand firm. Stand firm. So for us this week, we have to be reminded of the story of the Amalekites. Moses, which probably had no uh, you know, background with this bunch of people in military training, okay? Remember, they were slaves. They were not, you know, a military force or power. Moses calls Joshua and says, Joshua, we got a problem, man. It's like a serious problem. We got a basis. It's this crazy, crazy tribe, and they're not coming to see how we can negotiate things. They're coming to kill us. So once again, the strength that comes from the Lord is a strength that goes beyond the military abilities. It is the God who says to Moses, you raise your hands, and while the hands are raised up in the air, you win. Once the hands come down, you lose. And what the kids learned this week is that through the help of his brother Aaron and her, okay, Moses' hands are raised up in the air. And 
and I guess the principle that I want you to get in here is the issue of community. It's community. It's a sense of coming together, and this is why we're here as a church. Number four, here we go. Not only that God is with us, that He's the God who provides and He knows our needs, He's also the God who gives us His strength because of the task. The, the, the number four was a crucial one for us. Number four is the one that has to do with the salvation of God. Now, here is the implication. Again, this is not politically correct. This is not very attractive for many of us, but here's how the conversation begins. You and I are lost. Because if you don't begin the conversation by assuming that you're lost, you don't see the need for salvation. Right? Think about it. You have to begin the conversation that when God is present, He reveals your brokenness before He fix, fixes your brokenness. See, many of us, we approach the gospel just hoping that God gives us a tuna, a better to just change my spark plugs financially. Change my oil, you know, uh, physically. Just give me a better husband. Give me a better condition. See, that's not where God begins the conversation. God had to take these people who were no people. Are you following this? People who were no people. People who had no identity. People who were following. Come on, listen to the, to the logic. They were following a murderer. Moses was a guy who killed before. He had a bad reputation. You don't want to follow those pastors. You, you, they should have done a background check on Moses. The guy was very dysfunctional. And God told him, see, because that's exactly what, where the conversation begins. See, so the Bible says in Jeremiah, which Jeremiah is a prophet that has to deal with a generation who, who is not dealing with prophecy in a sense of what's coming their way. They are facing isolation. They are facing annihilation. They are facing exile. And God speaks with the prophet and says, For I am, once again, I am with you. Now, here's a little principle. The fact that God is with us does not imply that God, God approves what's happening to us. Can I say that one more time? The fact that God is with us does not imply that He approves what is happening to us. So please do not leave this place thinking that what you're going through, God is applauding you. If you're going through suffering, God is suffering with you. But He has a bigger reason a bigger picture that he's trying to show you. So listen to this. I am with you and I will save you, says the Lord. And again, you heard this from me before and I'm going to say it one more time. Salvation in God's economy before it becomes from hell, it becomes from your mother-in-law, it becomes from your financial struggles. Salvation is from self. Because if you look at this passage, this passage, you know, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, they were simply, look at me, they were simply the instruments of a reminder to the people of God that the moment that you walk away from me, you are history. Your successes are not successes. Your life is, is lifeless. Your future is not future. There is nothing that you can hold on if my presence moves away from you. So maybe for us today, right now, as we are facing whatever we're facing, we have to be reminded that maybe for us, we are so focused on being saved from hell that we forget that the number one enemy, maybe right now for some of us, is our very own self. That our worldview hasn't changed. That we value what God does for us versus valuing who God is. That maybe we have pushed backwards and instead of trusting the God of the scriptures, we're trusting our very own Logic needs way of seeing what they did and how mama raised me. And maybe, right now, maybe this is all coming to the climax, that maybe we are not relying on the strength of the Lord. Maybe what's happening is we're relying on our own strength. And that, obviously, is a problem. Well, here is where the principle came, and it was just a powerful time for us. Um, let, me, let me just share something with you on this. I've got, I got to finish my time here, but let me just share something with you. We had, a, we had a, little, a little girl, and, and I don't even know who she was, and I don't even know the age, but I think she was between seven to nine years old, that she had a hard time embracing this concept of the lamb. If you remember the story, nine plagues, this is the deliverance from Egypt, nine plagues, and the ten plague is basically the killing, here's where you get bloody and messy, the killing of the firstborn. Remember that? And basically this final massacre, 
execution across the land of the most powerful nation of the world. It's what basically conveys to Pharaoh. Pharaoh comes to Moses and sends him the emails. And Pharaoh, you may go. And deliverance comes into place. So the point of the story that I was trying to make with them is that, because this is a picture of life, deliverance, the joy of deliverance always has a price. In other words, the good news always begin with bad news. Are you following me on this? See, because American Christianity says, I'm coming to church because I want more bad news. See, you always begin the gospel embracing and saying, you don't need a better version of who you are. You need the blood of the Lamb to cover the multitude of sins that you and I constantly made. The trespasses that we basically practice on a daily basis. And this is politically incorrect again because you don't want to offend anybody. But I guess that's what I get paid to do. I just get paid to offend people. And we have to begin the conversation by saying there's going to be a price, there's going to be a sacrifice. Because here is, the, here is the conversation and how the kids understood this principle. We ended up by having, actually, not the Lord's Supper, but we practiced a Passover because the celebration of that evening is God coming and visiting. See, the holiness of God was going to go over the land of Egypt. And wherever you are not covered by the blood, you will, come on, you will die. See, God never comes and says, okay, don't do it again. Stop it. How many times I need to tell you? See, God didn't go through Egypt and say, one, two, have you seen those moms? In the marketplace? Three, and the kid is just like going crazy. I'm just like, stop it, mom. Stop with the one, two, and three, it's not working. It's never worked. See, God warned him and said, I'm coming tonight. The presence of God, before it brings salvation and glorification, it brings damnation. In other words, here's the point. The point of the story is that they need to understand, you need to understand that the, the ugliness of hell is not the lake of fire. The ugliness of hell is not that it's going to be, you know, eternal torment. Here is the ugliness of hell. The ugliness of hell, the ugliness of Egypt was basically that the presence of God shows up. See, because God is in hell. His holiness will show up and there will be no meaning. And if you face the holiness of God without the blood of Jesus, you are history. That's torment. Forget about Satan, man. I know he's powerful, but there is no way to compare the ugliness of the devil to the holiness of the God of the Bible. And that's the principle we have to embrace. Here's how we ended the conversation. This is, this is Friday. Woo, Friday, yay, we made it. Uh, nobody died. I hope and I still have a job. Here we go. God finally. What's the implication? Once again, the implications that we lost. You cannot look for a map. You cannot. See, I've said this before. I'm going to say it one more time. People who are lost, by the time, see, when you're driving, ooh, driving, uh, you, you know, trusting your GPS or whatever you're trusting, you're driving, by the time you realize you're lost, listen to me for a second. By the time you realize, you realize you're lost, you've been lost for a while. Right? In other words, you didn't get lost when you, whoa, I'm lost. No, 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 no. She's been telling you, you've been lost. <laughs> she just don't listen. But she's been telling you, she knew for a while. She's been checking the phone because she looked at her and said, this is a lost case. I'm just going to check on Facebook how things are going. How much gas we got? Ah, we'll make it. Let's just go. We passed the place about three blocks ago. He won't listen. See, that's kind of what the deal is. So before we talk about this guidance deal, let's begin the conversation by assuming that we're lost. We're lost. We are lost. And this is why I embrace, I'm, I embrace the full counsel of the Bible in the sense that this is where God speaks to Moses and says, okay, deliverance. I'm glad redemption took place back in Egypt. You know, the blood on the doorpost, there is freedom. And they walk through this whole thing of just exiting, you know, Egypt. They walk through dry land, but now they need instruction. This people need instruction. And the Bible says in the book of Psalms, you see on the screen, I will bless the Lord who... Guide me. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. This is, this is the most challenging stage for me. Because this is, the, this is the stage that will develop the character and the imagery of Jesus in you. So this is how we 
took this whole thing before them. We went through the Ten Commandments. And what we did with the Ten Commandments, we illustrated this for the kids with those mousetraps. Now, relax. We did not get a mousetrap to a kid for every kid. We just showed them to that. And we showed them that when you break one of the commandments, you will get hurt. Now here's the thing that we tried to convey to them, and I don't know if we, I don't know if we actually did it, I don't know if I did it, I try, I pray, and I hope I can get it through you, so you can tell them. The Ten Commandments do not exist to control you. They exist to protect you. Can, can, can you get that in your system this morning? <coughs> the Bible does not exist. Please listen to me. If God wanted to control you, if God wanted to control you, do you think that he will have a hard time controlling your temper or your whatever it is that you have going on in your life, financially or emotionally or you know, spiritually? He's God. He can do whatever he wants, right? So stop thinking that the Bible is in control. So what we did is we went through the Ten Commandments. We basically did, and we asked the kids to memorize them. And we went through this little hand, you know, uh, motion that helped them to understand that this is the God that is one, one true God. That was commandment number one. Commandment number two was basically, now with two hands, we went through this and they memorized it, okay? But now you should not have idols that you bow down in your life. Commandment number three, we went like this and we basically said, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, do not use His name in vain. Don't do that. Number four, this is the one that we went through this Sabbath, keep it holy and worship God through your rest. Number five, this is my favorite one and you're going to love it. We said, number five, honor your father and mother. Yeah. Give my little spanking. That's how you want it. Number six, this is the one that we talk about now adding another finger and you do not murder. Ugh. Don't murder anybody. It doesn't go well for you. Number seven is the one that we talk about how husband and wives stay together forever. Don't commit adultery. And then number eight is the one that we added as with the three fingers. Five and three, don't steal. Number next, which is nine, is the one that describes no lies. And finally, number ten is the one that we put all fingers because it is the one that says do not covet. So the kids learn. Some of you look like you need to learn. So I don't know if you know you would take a it's already, but then, but most of us we don't. And this little hand, you know, game really helped them to memorize those and help us to see and to learn those same commandments as a guide for everything that we do. I want to just ask you, as you pray with me today, and as I dismiss you, I want to ask you that you continue to pray for what happened this week. Um, um, I feel and I sense a huge responsibility because as a pastor, I'm just going to be honest with you, as a pastor, I saw... I told you that there was close to 50 people who actually helped us throughout this week. About 50 people from the church. Did you know that almost half of them, half of them, of the people who helped, they are brand new people in our church? That was just crazy. There's some people who helped us who are not even members of the church. Now you may be asking, so why, why do we ask them? Because we believe that you can belong without believing as long as you're not placing leadership. Are you following this? We will welcome you. We will make you feel part of the family, even if you haven't believed. Because ultimately, here's what I know. Ultimately, I don't have control on people believing the gospel. I own, I'm only responsible to present the gospel. Who makes the transformation? The Holy Spirit. So in due time, I believe people are going to believe. In due time, people are going to come to the realization of the principle. So, so here's what I saw throughout the deal. Because, by the way, I'm bringing this up because this is what I thought. I was the, I was the character who was teaching those things. I saw a lot of these adults who were taking the kids from place to place more attempt most of the time than the kids. They, I realized that some of the adults that we had working throughout this week, they did not know a whole of, a whole of this, you know, details of the story of Moses. So it was, it was a great reminder for all of us that we need to convey these things and we need to continually grow into this deal. Now here's the other side, exciting part of the deal. We got a lot of visitors. And then all those things between people working and helping between visitors just creates a sense of responsibility. And that's what I need you and I to pray this morning. That the gospel will continue to do the work that the gospel cannot lead to.
So from people who were greeters at the door, from people who were in the kitchen doing the hard work, from people who were outside playing games with the kids, for the, I mean, for all the preparation, this took about two weeks prior to this week to create everything that you, you have seen throughout the building, and God has honored the effort of His church. Would you please stand one more time?